my name is Sina Marzulia. Today I'm going to be talking about biological systems and technology. And so I'd just like to start with this cover from um, National Geographic a few years ago. So this is what they projected humans will look like in 2045, given the current trends that are going on in terms of assimilation. And so this, a central part of this presentation is how humans will change over time. And so I thought this was fitting to put in that we're not immune to change and our biology and obviously technology is going to change in the future. And so, so just as an introduction, I'm going to be doing some criticism of natural processes in this presentation. And so I just wanted to start with this quote. Um, it says, if you can't criticize, you can't optimize. And so the point of this criticism is to understand the weakness of biological systems and see how we can use technology to improve um, natural um, biology, physiology, and the human condition. And this is from Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, which is a fan fiction. So if you like Harry Potter and if you like this stuff we covered in this course, I highly recommend you go ahead and read that. So I'm going to start by talking about evolution because I think that's important to understand that our current physiology is through the process of evolution. And I use a plural ter term, um, evolutions. That's for a specific reason, and that's because I'm talking about all evolutions. And so evolution of a bird's wings is at cross purposes to a snake's fangs. And so the reason why I'm using evolution in the plural term is it's referring to all evolution that has occurred you know, for three billion or so years. And so we're, um, I'd like to point out that evolution is really slow and inefficient. And so this doesn't mean creationism. And I think to understand the process of evolution properly, I think it's important to acknowledge that it, it does have limitations and it's extremely slow. And so just really quickly, I just want to outline exactly how slow it is. And so if we suppose that there's a beneficial mutation and which gives us a 3% advantage in a population of 100,000. So using this equation, we can figure out that it's going to take approximately 768 generations for this to achieve universality. And so that's an incredibly long period of time. And of course, this, the gene has to spread in the first place. And so a gene that gives a, a 3% chance uh, or a 3% benefit is, has about 6% chance of spreading. So you can see how limited evolution really is. And this is in contrast to intelligent design. So when we talk about things like the technological singularity and the stuff that I'm going to be talking about in this presentation, intelligent design is a lot more efficient and it's a lot faster. And so, I mean, a computer programmer, you can sit down and you can program different parts, you can build a robot, and you can do this all in an extremely short period of time. You don't have to wait 768 generations for a beneficial mutation to, um, to become dominant in the, in the population. And so the reason why I'm making this comparison is when we talk about the plausibility of things like artificial intelligence and the, uh, the technological singularity, it's important to understand that um, yes, we haven't achieved true art artificial intelligence yet, but evolution has had three billion years and we're only had about 200 years to really start building these systems. So now I just want to talk about human physiology and some of the limitations of human physiology, which is a direct result of the inefficiency of evolution. So three main topics, um, metabolism, uh, the immune system, and finally, of course, the greatest weakness of all biological systems is uh, mortality. And so how can we use technology to try to get past that barrier? So first off, uh, the our metabolic system. So obesity is one of the biggest problems in today's world. And uh, my argument is that this is really due to the body's inability to control energy properly. So there's been a lot of effort to try to change the environment that we live in, so try to get more people active and eat more healthy. But that's incredibly difficult to do because of the world that we live in. So going back to evolution for a second, the reason why we, our bodies like to store extra energy as fat is because in the ancestral environment, which was you know, um, Africa for the longest period of time, and we were hunters and gatherers, um, so there was a scarcity of food generally. And there was constant activity. And so our body has evolved to um, hold on to every bit of extra energy. And so that was okay for 50,000 years ago, but today this is a serious problem because 
we're constantly surrounded by um, high calorie food and McDonald's and sugar and our activity level has dropped right because of cars and transportation and so this has led to a lot of cardiovascular problems and a lot of the uh, obesity um, stroke and it's just not efficient so what I believe is we can use technology to improve this and now for this first example this is not something that has been worked on but theoretically if we can use software or brain chips to reprogram the way our body processes energy. And so even if we reprogram the way taste buds process energy, so our taste buds, um, they've evolved to find food that's high in calories really uh, appealing. So this is why ice cream tastes really good because it's full of calorie rich, so your taste buds really are attracted to that. But it's not, actually good for your body. So your body is flawed in the sense that it doesn't know what's really good for it. And so if taste buds can be reprogrammed, so I don't know, broccoli maybe can taste good. Um, things that are high, uh, rich in nutrients, rich in vitamins, if they can taste good and not just empty calories, I think that would make a great difference. And just generally how the body processes energy. Um, so again, this isn't something, I mean, brain implants are possible, but we're not at the point yet where we can reprogram the hypothalamus to better manage energy resources. But again, I, um, if you remember, we're just working, or we're just doing scientific research for about 100 or 200 years. So I do think that once we hit that technological singularity, I think that this will become a real possibility. So the next system that I want to talk about is the immune system, and this is more based on what is actually currently possible. Before I get in how we can improve it, here are just some ways that uh, I think the immune system is flawed. So just a few things that I think is wrong with the immune system is, for example, regulation of abnormal cell growth. So if the immune system was really efficient at doing its job, cancer wouldn't be a problem because any cell that has abnormal growth, it would immediately destroy it. And so the incidence of cancer and the rise in all kinds of cancer that we're seeing is really at its core a failure of the immune system. Similarly, inhibiting excess tissue inflammation, which a lot of dis uh, diseases are a result from excessive inflammation and the body can't regulate that properly. Suppression of function with external stressors. So what I mean by this is when you get sick, your body releases factors that try to uh, make you sleepy, make you tired. And it, on, at some level, it does make sense for your body to do that because it wants you to rest while it's fighting the pathogen, but if there could be a way to, so you can do other things while your body is fighting the, the pathogen, I think that's great. For example, if your computer has a, a virus, um, you don't necessarily have to shut everything down just so you can get rid of the virus. You can do, also you can search the internet while it's getting rid of the virus. So um, proper threat recognition. So this is a problem with allergies. So the fact that in some portion of the population, um, people with peanut allergies, the immune system finds a peanut as a threat. Um, I think that's a fundamental flaw in, in, the, in the immune system. Um, if your computer, as soon as you went on a single web page, started overheating and doing all this crazy stuff, you would say that problem, the computer had a problem. Right? And of course, lack of agility and speed in updating itself. Um, so again, if your computer gets a virus, it's really easy to come up with an antivirus program to get rid of that. But if a new virus comes up, like something like Ebola, then that's a serious problem because our immune systems aren't equipped properly to, to handle that virus. So one way we can use technology is through nanotechnology, and this is something that uh, we talk about during the course. So nanobots are really tiny, and so they can be utilized and they could be injected directly into the bloodstream and they can you know, detect and destroy cancer cells. So again, the immune system to some extent can destroy cancer cells, but obviously it is a problem and it can't do that perfectly. And nanobots can be utilized to supplement this uh, system in that way. Replace traditional cancer treatment methods. So one problem, with, for example, chemotherapy is not only does it destroy the cancer cells, but it also destroys non-cancer cells, so healthy tissue. Whereas nanobots, you can, they can be programmed 
to only target cancer cells. Similarly with surgery, a surgeon can go in but can only remove the cancer to some extent. There's always going to be side effects and damage to healthy tissue. And with nanobots, this wouldn't be a problem. And of course, it can help in identifying pathogens and viruses. And it can even remove particles from the bloodstream. So if there's cl uh, excess cholesterol clogging arteries, you can use nanobots to go in there and take them out. And again, since they're so small, this can be done on a molecular level. Okay, and so you're not doing any damage to actual tissue, you're just uh, dealing with the actual problem. So finally, for the third part uh, of my talk, I'm gonna be talking about immortality. Before I go in to see how we can use technology to achieve immortality, I just wanna talk about um, some opposition. Because every time, usually when I mention to people the idea of immortality, they say they don't wanna live forever and that's not something you would want. And so now that anti-aging research is a real possibility, I think it's uh, important to have this discussion because no one would argue that we should ever um, give up on a person. So if you're against the, more, the idea of living forever, the question I would ask you is, at what age should we just give up? Is it 80, 100, 120? And if you think that we should fight for every additional day to your life. So if you want to live tomorrow, and then tomorrow you want to live the day after, and so on and so forth, logically, you want to live forever. And so this is just something that's been coming up because no one, I don't think anyone argues that at a certain age you should just let people on their own because we don't want, we're against this philosophical uh, idea of achieving immortality. So what are some ways we can actually go about this? So before I, again, go into technology, the life expectancy has been increasing over the, uh, over the years. And I think it's important to mention that this has mostly been due to improved nutrition, better hygiene, so public health uh, kind of factors. And so there hasn't been a technological revolution that has resulted in the increased life expectancy, but which is kind of goes against what I'm saying with the, what I'm about to talk about, like the mind uploading technology and singularity. But so far, it's been due to public health factors. And so this is just a chart showing from around the 1920s, you can see a steady increase in life expectancy. So what does the future hold? And so one possibility is, again, because biological systems by nature are fragile, but our data or memories and the self is not. So potentially the idea of mind uploading is if you can take the data in the mind, if you can somehow find a code that the brain uses to store memories in the hippocampus and different areas of the brain, then potentially you can transfer that to a uh, computer interface and that's going to last forever basically because your computer, uh, your data in your computer isn't going to get destroyed and if your computer gets destroyed you can always just take a USB and uh, transfer the data. So again, mind uploading is just referring to the process of copying mental content from a uh, brain substrate and com uh, copying it to a computational device. So there's a current project that was started by President Obama, I think, in 2010. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to map the entire brain, um, like every neural circuit. And the goal of this is just to understand every single um, part of the brain to the last neuron. One of the problems, one of the challenges that they're facing is that there's about you know, a trillion neurons in the brain and trillions of synapses, and current computers don't have the capability to deal with all that data. So one of the things they're working on is increasing com computer capability to be able to process all that data. Once they achieve that goal, I'm not sure what it means because before they sequenced the human genome, they thought once we finish sequencing the genome, we'll figure out um, we'll know everything about the human body, and then they did it, and now we're not so sure. But it is potentially possible if we were to figure out the code of um, the nervous system, which is really action potentials, um, to transfer that data to a compu computer interface and see where that goes. So in terms of comparing human brains versus computers, theoretically the hardware exists to accommodate uh, to be able to 
simulate a human brain. It's just, again, the software isn't there. So in terms of speed, if Moore's law holds, and Moore's law, of course, is the idea of the, that uh, technology is exponentially increasing, a, su a supercomputer may be able to simulate a human brain faster at perceived speed than an actual human brain. Uh, neurons can generate a maximum of 200 to about 1,000 action potentials per second. And in 2013, the clock speed of a microprocessor reached 5.5 gigahertz, which is 5 million times faster. So current processors can actually process information 5 million times faster than, it's, than individual neurons. So theoretically, um, it's not out of the realm of engineering possibility that a, com a supercomputer or even a normal computer can simulate a human, a human brain. Um, again, the problem comes in terms of the software. Um, that's just not a possibility at the moment. But again, um, going back to the first part of the, of the presentation, evolution has had about three billion years to come up with the human mind. Um, so if you give evolution enough time, like three billion years, you start with, from a single cell. Three billion years later, you have intelligent organisms. Uh, whereas scientific research and intelligent design, we've had about 100 to 200 years, and we're already pretty close to, I would say pretty close to achieving the same thing, same kind of goal. The advantage that we have is, of course, we have a model, <clears throat> a model to go by. So. And finally, I just want to mention, so overall, I think you get the impression that I'm optimistic about the future. And I understand that there, there is a lot of problems associated with um, either replacing human physiology or improving on human physiology with technology. But um, I would, what I want to say is that the exact consequences, they're difficult to predict um, because you don't know what changes are going to happen. So when they first invented the calculator, people said, you know, this is going to cause the collapse of society because no one's going to think anymore and we're all done for. But that's not what happened. That's what happened was things worked out and things got a lot better. So, I mean, what, what would happen if you achieve immortality? I think if you introduce immortality tomorrow and you just ch everything else stays the same, I think that would lead to severe consequences. But I think what you have to remember is in a world where you have immortality, you also have a lot of other changes as well. So we could be colonizing the moon. We would probably have the technology to colonize Mars. And so the problems like that you would expect, like overpopulation, um, some people have said, well, what would you do if you had an infinite amount of time? Um, again, 100 years ago, people, if you told people if, um, that lived about 40 years, well, you're going to have double your life. You're going to live to 80. They would say, well, what, what are you going to do with double the life? There's nothing to do. But other things have changed as well, where you can, there's a lot more activities. Um, there's just more things to do with your time. And so, um, again, I sound optimistic, and, but I, I do realize that there are consequences um, to be had with all of these, all of these changes. Yep, and that's all. Thank you. Just living a long time is not necessarily such a good thing. Living a long time and remaining well and functional, and reversing aging. I, I mean that that. Do these things seem possible to you? Are, are, they, are they part of what you're thinking? Or are you sort of going for the wrinkled prune model where people get older and older and older and older and they just never die, but, the, but they, they're really hard to look at at a certain period of time? And so Yeah, so when I, when I talk about immortality, I, um, I should have mentioned I'm talking exclusively about living healthy and living long because... Yeah. If you're living, like, technically you could be kept alive on machines where a machine is pumping blood through your body and it's breathing for you, but that's not of much use. Right. So when we're talking about, um, especially about the mind upload, where you can upload yourself to a different interface, mm -hmm. um, we're talking about living, but living as a healthy individual that can learn, that can move around, that can work, that can be productive. 
right. and not necessarily, you know, in a hospital, just being kept alive, alive by a machine. You know? Yeah. It, as you think about these things, does it seem to you like you're going to see them in your own lifetime sometime soon, or do they seem very remote to you? Yeah, or? I'm... I'm in like endless optimist about these things, so I hope it's within my lifetime. <laughs> um, especially because, like, I think, I hope that it's within my family's lifetime too. Mm -hmm. Because yes. I want everyone I know to live forever. Yeah. Um, whether that's going to happen, there's some estimates that by 2045, um, we might be able to achieve something like that. Right. But again, it's really hard to predict because of, you never know. I've talked a lot about this, all of us being crowded at the top of Maslow's pyramids of, of needs. What do you think will actually happen about that? Like, if you were to go out in the street today and talk to a lot of people about, you know, how are you going to spend your time when robots can do everything that we do now and you're going to never die? So what, what's your plan? What are you going to do? Most people don't have a plan for that. And, 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 and so how, how do you think that's going to pan out? What's going to actually happen? Yeah. Are people who, don't, who actually never read a single poem and think po po poetry is stupid, are they going to start writing poetry? Or, or how, how is this going to work? <laughs> yeah, well, I would say, again, it's going to be a really different world. If you look back 60 years, I yeah. think most people just finished high school and they were done. Yeah. And whereas now we're getting more undergraduates, more graduate students, PhDs, et cetera. So one potential thing would hap that would, might happen is education might be increased. So mm -hmm. you might have to get like three PhDs, which sounds terrible. But <laughs> um, if you're, again, if you have an infinite amount of time, then getting five degrees might not be yeah. implausible. And again, I with, there, there's going to be different changes too. So space travel, for example. Mm -hmm. um, if you have an infinite amount of time spending 100 years in space going to a different you know, solar system, that's not, so, yeah. again, implausible. So. And, and probably there will be ways to spend one's time that are profitable and fun that we can't even conceive of now, you know, like, like new facets. What kind of social problems do you think society will encounter if everyone's healthy? For example, everyone's the same age, same capabilities. Is that beneficial, you think, or? So associated with uh, immortality? Sorry. Yeah, imm immortality. That's Again, with these things, it's really difficult to pre predict. I would say that if everyone is living forever, um, obviously we're not, we can still like kill someone. So terrorism would still exist, right? And in terms of, if everyone's mind is uploaded into computers, into the ones and zeros, then hacking might be a whole new level of threat, right? Because right now, if a hacker hacks into your computer, they're just hacking your photos and your information. But if your entire consciousness is in your, in your laptop, well, that's going to be a serious problem. Yeah, we, we've had two lecturers who actually didn't l lecture this term who both talked about once you have a mind upload, then you can engage in all sorts of risk-taking behavior because, you know, if, if you do something uh, risky and get run over by a truck, then your, your mind can be reestablished re in some other being you know, and you, you've lost a few hours, but maybe that day wasn't going that well anyway, so if you lost the, the hour where you're getting run over by the truck, that's okay, you know, it's just not a part of your consciousness, and you just keep on going. So, so um, life would really change in the sense that, yes, you, you can still harm other people, you can kill other people, but they can come back, and <laughs> there, there are consequences, right? You, 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 um, you know, when I was in that other body, you killed me, and so now, yeah. So yeah. anyway, um, and, and the whole idea of once you have an upload, and once you've experienced this idea of wanting to do more than one thing at one time, why would you upload your consciousness to only one entity then? 
why wouldn't you do it to five or something so you can be ha hanging out with your girlfriend and going to the ball game and all, you know, what, whatever thing. You can do them all, all at once and with your increased mental capacity with the um, brain implants and so on, you could use that to keep track of running multiple different lives at one time. It, it becomes really quite complicated and with some moral complications too, I think. So yeah, I think presumably at, at key times, if, if you're sort of dividing your, your life into five different beings that are off doing different things, they come back together and have a reunion and sort of, you know, account for what they've been up to periodically. And they have to talk to, you know, Ur Earl Waugh about the moral depravity of, you know, their five lives and stuff, right? Yeah, the best way I, I think about it is if you go back and tell someone in the 17th century and you tell them about planes and technology, yeah. I mean, they, would, they wouldn't be, be able to imagine what sort of things we can do. And to them, it would seem all bizarre, bizarre and yes. crazy. So I think it's the same sort of relationship if you, if you were to fast forward a thousand years. Yeah. And then come back. And then no, I, I think I'm an optimist as you are. I think, uh, you know, amazing things we cannot conceive of today will happen. You can also think if you're a pessimist that something very dire could happen to prevent absolutely all of that. But uh, hopefully that won't, won't occur. I just have kind of a question for the class. How many of you guys want to like immortality? So I, I think it's, a, it, let, let me just preface this question by saying that if you were to ask that question generally to, to you know, the population on White Avenue, mo most people would not, they, they think it's, first of all, it's sort of religion based and it's a weird question anyway, but they don't want it. That, 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 but um, so I, I guess it, it involves certain you know assumptions about what it what it would be like, right? But yeah, I I'd, I'd be interested to hear what what the students feel about that. Depends in what state. Yes and no. If I can stay in a twenty year old body, yes. If not, probably not. <laughs> no, not not even a little bit. Um, even if everybody can live to forever and we're all healthy, I just, what's the point in life if there's nothing, like everything just at that point seems so trivial? Like why do you want to learn more or feel more or feel less? It just, it doesn't matter I think if you have infinite lives, everything is less significant. For me, personally. Maybe I'm a pessimist, I guess. Uh, given the same quality of life, I think I would live forever. And to kind of answer your question of why you'd want to, I think I'm too curious to know what technology will be like in a thousand years. Like if given the opportunity to live forever, I think I would definitely take it just because curiosity. I think it depends quite a bit too. Like if you ask people now, they would say no because like we have no concept of what the world will be like. So like there's nothing to do right now at like if you had infinite time. Whereas like in the future, maybe there will be. So in the future, maybe yes, but I'd say now, no. I'm still kind of flip-flopping between both sides, but I think I would lean towards wanting to live forever just because um, there would be so much that you could do um, in the future, you would have like more technology. And then I think just the different possibilities for what you could do, as you mentioned earlier, like space travel would be something I'd like to see. And yeah. Well, um, all the major religions uh, declare that humans are going to live again in some form. So you'd have to think that at least in some form of science, that this indicates a uh, predisposed or predestined uh, sense and hope to live forever, an immortality thing. So maybe what you have presented today is nothing more than a science-veiled 
religious uh, focus. Um, as for whether or not I would like to live forever, uh, the answer to that is no, uh, not given the kind of bodily construction and limitations that that is, are imposed upon us by aging and by a limitation of knowledge and all of that. So the assumption in the question is so huge that I would have to say no. So I, I think it, it very much comes back to this idea of reversing aging and how extreme that could be. And in science fiction, you know, you can reverse it back to age eight, 18, 20, whatever, stay there forever. Um, but I don't know what will really be possible. Um, and and um, yeah, there, there, there are many other questions, aren't, aren't there? But the, the, this whole idea of um, life after death and what that's like and the, the being so tied into you know religion it's it it it's hard to sort of make yourself think purely about that you know without getting into one particular uh religious rut or uh, another uh, or, or way of way of thinking um but anyway, um, I, I think you stimulated some very good discussions. So yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.